Coming together for Colorado tonight as dozens of people can now call themselves U.S. citizens. They were sworn in at a naturalization ceremony in Denver this morning. Our Sean Chitness was there, shows us just what this meant for these new citizens. Just days after celebrating America's independence outside, the city and county building welcomed the country's newest citizens inside. America already is my home, so I want to stay here permanently. Dong Yang Wang has lived in the United States for almost 20 years. Wang says now she feels more at home here than in China. I feel so encouraged, you know, so many people, so many different stories. One of many taking the oath. After years in this country, it's an honor to become a citizen. Be loyal, faithful, and responsible for, for God and for this country. Even a former Colorado Avalanche player, originally from Canada, became a citizen of the United States. This country has given us a lot, and uh, you know, you just want to give back to it whichever way you can. After taking the oath, they waited for their names to be called. A celebration of citizenship decades in the making, each spending a year just to finish the process after becoming eligible. Finally, the color guard representing one of the oldest communities of this country closed the ceremony, opening the next chapter for the newest citizens of the United States. As long as you are working hard, studying hard, I think the dream can become true. Sean Chitness, covering Colorado first. depended on what others thought of you. This lady named uh, Nancy Holton, she, she, uh, she, hold on. <laughs> Put that in my back pocket, okay. There we go. What if it depended on what others thought of you? So, anyway, <laughs> she fell asleep in a van as her mom was driving from Holland and she woke up in the, the country of Switzerland. Now, she wasn't born Swiss, but she had certain opinions and she grew up a vegan. Now. The Swiss are not vegan. I'm not a vegan. Swiss are not vegan. She also, she didn't like church bells, which the Swiss like church bells. And she didn't like cowbells, which if you didn't know, that's a kind of a big deal in Switzerland. They hang the cowbells. Well, because, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like animal abuse because it's really loud in the cow's ears. So she became a viral sensation because she was turned down for citizenship in the town of Gip Oberfrick. 144 of the 206 villagers who voted voted her down because she was too annoying. <laughs> she was too annoying. She had a big mouth. I guess that's what it was. Uh, <laughs> and what if, what if people could turn you down for citizenship because of how annoying you were? A lot of us in here would be in trouble, I think. <laughs> so, my goal for you today, no matter if you're annoying, it's all right, or you're popular or not, my goal for you today is for you to know that you belong in the kingdom of God. I want you to walk away knowing and feeling that you belong to God, that he loves you, and that you are a part of his family. I want you to believe. So we're looking in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. And if you have your Bibles, you can open up to that. We have been in a series called uh, Ephesians 2, Ephesians, Who is God? Asking the questions, who is God and who am I? And so for today, we're asking the question, who am I? Now, the book of uh, chapter, Ephesians, chapter 2, is broken up kind of into three sections. The first part we're going to talk about is, who am I before Christ? Who am I before Christ? And this is really easy to see because it starts off with this. As for you, you were. Now, everyone who has become a believer, they were something before, and now they have started to be something different. So this is you. If you're a believer, this is what you were before. I'm not sure if many of you here remember who you were before. I was third grade when I became a Christian, and so some of that I forget a little bit. And so it's good for Paul to remind me who I was before. So let's go ahead and read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So a qualification of those who live in this world now, they are dead. We were dead. What's it mean to be dead? I mean, dead is dead. You can't interact with people. You've been cut off from the land of the living. 
You're not able to interact with anyone around you. You can't, you, the people, dead people can't touch, they can't hear, they can't feel, they can't see. Now here it's talking about a, a dead, not, not a dead body, because they're not physically dead, they're spiritually dead. You are dead in your transgressions and sins. Now, spiritually dead is different, different than physically dead, because if you kick a dead, physically dead person, they're not going to kick you back. But if you, if you kick a spiritually dead person, they're probably going to kick you back. They'll, they'll probably do that. Spiritually dead means I, am, I cannot communicate with, with God. I'm not able. Here's a, here's a definition. Oh, wait, here's a picture of <laughs> kind of a coffin. This is what it looks like. So if we are spiritually dead, not able to respond to impulses or perform functions, unresponsive to life-giving influences. Unresponsive to life-giving influences. This is on your outline. This means you're not able to respond to the life-giving influence, the life-giving source of God. When God reaches out to someone who's spiritually dead, they're not able to reach back unless God opens their heart. Unless he opens their ears. They're unable to see him, unable to feel him. If you've ever been in a conversation with someone who's spiritually dead and you're trying to get something across, or just any conversation in general, some idea you want to, like, you ever, people just don't get it. Like, what? I don't understand what you're saying. I don't get it. When someone's spiritually dead, God is speaking, or we're speaking to them about who he is, and it just doesn't, it doesn't fly. They don't get it. This is before salvation. It's because after salvation, you still may not get some things, but you eventually will. In John chapter 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He says, uh, he says I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. If you're in, after salvation, that means eventually you will bear them. Eventually you will get them, but right now you can't. But for a spiritually dead person, they will never. They will not until God opens their heart and opens their mind. It says, you are dead in your transgressions and sins. Now, transgressions is missing the mark, not living up to the standard, not getting there. So when we were born, we were born into sin, and there's two kinds of sin. We were born into sin, original sin, can't get, nothing we can do to get out of it, but also we have chosen to sin. These are deliberate acts against God. This deliberate transgressions and sins, we chose to hang up the phone. We chose to turn away from God. And as a result of that, <laughs> uh, there's consequences. And it says in Ephesians 2 here, I am deserving of wrath. And Pastor Paul talked a little bit about that last week. The problem with dead people is they don't know they're dead. And that's where we were at before. And Paul wants us to remember that. He really does. He wants us to remember and it's good for us to remember where we came from. But now, on to the good news. But, Ephesians 2, 4, here we go. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. Even when we were dead in transgressions. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 is a great one to memorize. It says, but God demonstrates. He shows. He puts into action His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. And He did it. This is proof that God did it in spite of us. Jesus reached out all the time to people in spite of themselves. Levi, the tax collector. Nobody liked him. Why does Jesus hang out with tax collectors and sinners? In spite of them, Jesus reaches out. In spite of you, even though you were dead, Jesus re reached out to you. The woman caught in adultery. Nothing she could do. She was stuck there. Her potential future, her probable future, was to be stoned. But it didn't happen. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. I reach out to you in spite of where you're at. Now go now and sin no more. He gives mercy, and eventually I think he may give grace in that situation. And the disciples, they argued about who the greatest was. Peter, he denied Jesus, and still God reached out to Peter in spite of him. Lost sinners like us, we're not just sick people and needing help. We're dead people needing life. Lost sinners are not just sick people needing help. They're dead people needing life. So this is who we are before Christ. If I don't know who I am before Christ, it's, there's no point in talking about who I am after. 
good to remember where we came from. Now, moving on. The second part of Ephesians chapter 2, if you look in your text, starts around verse 4 or verse 5. And this is who I am after Christ. Come on, there's a definite distinction. Obviously, we all know that. Now, when you're reading the Bible, uh, when, I w- when I went to Bible college, before that, I didn't really like studying grammar because grammar is like really boring. It really is. But then I got really super excited about sentence diagramming. It was so cool. Why? Here's why did I do that? Because all Scripture is God-breathed and useful. All Scripture. That means even down to the words. It's not like, it's not like you, you throw a bunch of a rocks and dirt into a, a sifter and you sieve it out and you get some good stuff at the bottom and then the rest of the stuff you throw away. No. When you, when you sift God's Word, all that fouls out is gold nuggets. It's cool. And so you can take any word from Scripture and take that apart and look at it, chew it, think about it. It's like, it's like chocolate morsels you take out, right? Hmm, I'll take this one, bite it, put that back for a little while. Hmm, think about it. Oh, I'm going to have another bite of that same one. Okay, that's what it's like when we mine God's Word. So it's important to look at the particular words and what they mean. Now, we're going to talk about verbs today. So a verb is an action word. And we're looking about, we're going to look at past tense, present tense, and future tense. So there's a good chance if something ends in ED, it has to do with a a past tense. So we're going to particularly look at who I am now. This is after Christ. If you are a believer, you are these things now. Not like I hope I will be. Not, I man, if I'm good enough, I'm going to be great. It's going to be awesome. I can be these things someday. Not if I feel close enough to God, I will be these things. No, I am these things now. Okay? So you guys, a couple weeks ago, you got some highlighters, right? Who has been using their highlighters? Who's been using their highlighters? Yes? Yes, great. Okay, just so you know, I wanted to, I voted for the cheap highlighters, but they bought you the nice ones. Okay, so you better be using them. <laughs> I was like, get the cheap ones. No, we got to get good ones so they don't mess up their Bibles. All right, so we're going to look at all of the verbs, the action words to talk about who we were, we were in Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bible, open that up, and here we go. Okay, here's, here's the whole chapter. That's half the chapter on the left-hand side. I'm highlighting. Now, I may have missed some, but I'm going to try to work our way through them. The first one, we have been made alive. Made. Past tense. I was dead. I've been made alive. God has breathed his life into our hearts and gave us life. We were not alive, and now we are. That was God's sovereign work. It was an act he did. As a believer, it's done. You're kind of like, oh, I feel dead today. No, you're not, you're not dead. You may feel different, but you are alive. Have confidence in this. Second one, you have been saved. Not like I hope I get saved. Not like I hope if I do good enough today, God will save me. He'll forgive me because, man, I, I really want to be forgiven. You have been saved. Now, what's it mean to be saved? Salvation, the idea is that God has rescued you. He's, he's taken you from where you were. You were drowning. Jonah was drowning. He pulled him up out of the water. My brother is a, a fishing guide, and he, uh, he, he knows the rivers really well. He goes salmon fishing. At one point, he was out in the boat, and he had two guys in his boat, and they had their poles in, and he saw over the corner of his eye a guy on the shore. He had waders, and he slipped. And the water went above his waders, and about a second and a half, his waders filled up, and he was gone. He was under. His friends are like, hey, hey, start yelling. I mean, it's in the middle. It's the wilderness. And now the people are around. And you can't, I mean, it, it, the water was milk. Jared saw it. Said, okay, guys, guys, step your poles. Pull them in. In the boat now. Pull the anchor. And because Jared knows the river so well, and he knows the currents, and he'd been there a hundred times, he maneuvered down the river, and the guy never popped up. He didn't come up. Normally you pop up, and you see a hand. Nothing. It was 30 seconds underwater. Jared maneuvered the boat. He got to a spot where he thought he was. He put his hand down in the water like this and grabbed him and pulled him up. 30 seconds in cold water, full boots. Another five, I mean, 30 seconds is a long time. Another five, 10 seconds, that guy's dead. He's done. They thought he was done. How would that feel to be that guy? And feel the hand grab you. That's life. You have been saved. 
Maybe you have forgotten what that was like to reach your hand up and feel that hand when you are drowning. But God wants you to know. He wants you to feel that. David says in Psalm 51, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. God, thank you. You have been saved. Past tense. It's done. Now you've got a seat with Christ in heaven. You've been saved. You've been raised up. You were done. You got pulled out, raised up. You were down. You're no longer a peasant. Well, you are supposed to be humble, but you're no longer a peasant. But God has raised you up. And what did he do next? He seated us with him. And it says, if this is in verse chapter 1 as well, in, verse, in chapter 1, and he seated us with him in the heavenly realms. When it talks about being seated in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, and Paul uses this terminology, he, it's, a, it's a royal kind of terminology. God t- picks us up, and he seats us with him in the heavenly realms. Where does Jesus sit? He sits on a throne. We sit with Christ, in Christ. To be seated with God, with, with, with Jesus Christ, it's a, a position of authority. It's a position of privilege. It's a position, position that we didn't earn. We got raised up and seated with him. And the interesting thing about seated, when you're seated, it's not, a, it's not an active kind of thing. It's not God. It's not, it's not standing up. Because when I stand up, I'm ready to do something. I take authority and I act. When I'm seated, it's a passive authority. It's a passive power. It's a passive position. You get to be that with Christ. You get to sit with him and have the confidence knowing you have to work for it. You're there. This is not in the past. If I work hard enough, eventually I get to heaven. No, I'm seated with him now. I have been saved, once again. Been saved. I'm created in Christ Jesus to do good works. I am created. You are created. You're not a mistake. You're not an accident. You're not a bad decision by your parents. You are created in Christ Jesus. There's a purpose behind your life. To do good works. And this is all the time Christ fills you with his heart and his spirit to go do good works. That means as soon as you walk out of here, you get in your car and you drive home, God has a plan for you that he wants you to do good works. Those dishes, yeah, they're waiting. <laughs> they're waiting. God's got a plan to use you because he's created you for that. Not in the past. No, it's already set in place. He's already got a plan for you. Created to do work, good works. We've been brought near. He went to a far away. have been brought near. We're not far away anymore. I feel far away, Sky. I don't feel like God's close. It doesn't matter how you feel. You are close. God's brought you near. There's nothing separating you from God. You say, God, forgive me. My sin. He is there, ready to wipe sins away again and again and again. Though he already did it and it's already done. You have been brought near. You have been reconciled to God. The debt has been paid. You owed a big debt. You were planning on, I mean, you're, you were, your destiny was eternal separation from God. The debt has been paid. Now you get to go to him. Now you're with him. You have access to the Father. You get a chance to get in. You get the ticket. It is nice to have a ticket to heaven. Life with Christ is more than a ticket to heaven, but you do get the ticket. We have access to be close to God. We've been made fellow citizens, like this, uh, this, this TV broadcast, and we'll talk about that later, as well as we've been made members of God's household. We were nuns, once not members, but now we are. We've been adopted into the family. talks about that in Ephesians 1. I say we go through all of this, and here's the list being built together into be a, becoming a, a temple in which God lives by His Spirit. We have all these things. Hopefully you can go home and you can kind of read through this. Maybe I missed one. Let me know if I did. Uh, who am, which one of these do you need to be reminded of the most? And this is kind of a cool thing to go through. Remember I said each word of God is a gold nugget. You can take each one of these, seated, saved, raised, made alive, access. Look up what each one of those words mean and kind of meditate on it. It's a good, good thing to do. Now, to summarize all this, I could say, I have been made alive and accepted. I'm alive and accepted. And he's done all this by the miracle of grace. I am who I am because of grace. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is the holy, generous act of God that shows the holy, generous nature of God 
God wasn't someone before in the Old Testament. Now he's decided to be someone different. No, this is who he is, and he's always been this way. For me, I, I, uh, I, I like basketball. I like soccer better, just to be clear. But I do like basketball. I play basketball. And for the longest time, I joined the church team last year and the year before. They had to tell me, like, over and over again, Scott, that's a foul. That's a foul. I just don't... I try to get a foul. I try to understand what a foul is, but I just foul all the time. And I don't mean to. I just, I play hard, right? I'm aggressive. I'm, very, I'm just very aggressive as a person. It's good for the field, not for the pastorate. <laughs> it's not, not good for being a pastor, but it's great when you're on the field and you're fighting for the ball. Okay? So a, a, when, a foul, when I foul somebody, I'm like, ah! Sorry, I didn't mean to. Sorry. In fact, the prayers before the game, I said, God, help us when we foul to not foul too hard. And to quickly ask forgiveness when we do, because I know I'm going to do it. So a foul in basketball is not great. i got a picture of a foul here. This is a guy named Bill Lambeer, and he's fouling Larry Bird. Does that look like a foul? (laughs) He's clobbering him, man. He's like taking him out. I mean, it's like football. It looks like that. Now, after this happens, what do you think is supposed to happen? Larry Bird could go, it's all right. I forgive you. Give me a hug. Here's what happens. There's a brawl, all right? There's a brawl. They take each other, they're fighting, they're wrestling on the ground. Now, when this kind of thing happens on the court, who has the power on the court? Who decides what's going to happen? It's a referee, right? So he decides, yep, you were wrong, you were right. That was definitely a foul, by the way, Bill. And then he sends him off. Well, the referee, he has the chance to say grace, show grace. But he can't. He's not. The ref's not allowed to show grace. He's not, he's not a referee if he shows grace. The ref has to call it by the law. Got to call it. Well, God, God gives us grace. That's the difference between God and the referee. God shows grace. And he had to kill his son in order to do it. He had to kill his son in order to do it. My Bible college professor, Dr. Needham, he defined grace as this, as the unmerited release of God's limitless love. Grace is something that costs everything to the giver and nothing to the receiver. And it's given to those who don't deserve it, who barely even recognize it, and who hardly appreciate it. Grace is given to those who don't deserve it, who barely recognize it, and hardly appreciate it. Let's read in Ephesians 4 and 5. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you've been saved. It's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. God saved us not not because we were righteous, not because of anything good we did, not because we got good grades, not because our parents are rich or cool, not because we fit into the in crowd. God saved us not because we should come to church every day, every week. That's not the reason why he saved us. My son Parker, when he was 24 weeks in the womb, we saw the ultrasound, and we saw that he had a cleft lip and palate. Now, cleft lip and palate means there's a his lip is separated here, and there's likely a hole above his 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 uh, the top of his mouth, and it opens up into a sinus cavity. Well, that kind of thing is super severe. There's the risk we you need several surgeries to get out of it, to to fix it, if it ever is able to be fixed totally. It's sinus problems for the rest of your life. You can't speak, you can't feed. We saw this. Here's a picture of Parker when he was born a couple days after. Cute little boy, but he didn't, he didn't understand the severity of, situation, of his situation. He didn't understand where he was at. He didn't understand the dis- deformity and the disability that he would likely have for the rest of his life. But he had a father and mother who did and were willing to do something. And he was born into a country that has medicine that can deal with this stuff, with doctors who can go to college and get educated in in order to do these kind of things. He didn't deserve these privileges, but about several months into his life, he he had surgery. 
his parents decided to act. He had no idea what was happening. And this is how he looks now. <laughs> this is uh, a couple months ago, that abandoned. Parker cannot boast about what he's been given. He can't say, I worked extra hard. And when it comes to us receiving the gift of God, we just got to receive it. We just got nothing you can do to earn it. It's not an award that you get. And the cool thing for Parker is that he was given grace, and now he didn't just get fixed, but he got to be part of the family. He got to be accepted in, and you get to be accepted in through no action of your own. For it's by grace you've been saved, and there's a clause. It's been grace you've been, by grace you've been saved through faith. Through faith. Now, why would it say through faith? Because faith is the only indispensable condition. The difference between Parker and you is you have a choice. Parker didn't have the choice. No, don't, don't, don't fix my, my lip. Don't fix it. You can do that. No, I don't want it. The only way to receive grace is to reach out your hand and take it. To open up your hand and say, yes, Lord, I want it. If you will not accept it, you cannot have it. If you won't accept it, you can't have it. If you don't take it, you can't have it. Why would I not accept or appreciate this grace? Why wouldn't I, why wouldn't I do it? Well, because I think maybe I don't need it. I'm good. I like my lip. I like my fallen nature. It's fun. I love following the cravings of the flesh and the sinful nature. It's awesome. So much fun. Maybe I think I'm strong enough without grace. I'll be fine. I'll be okay. In essence, when we say something like that, we're saying something else. I, I draw my identity and my strength from something else other than God. Whatever in your heart you find is supremely valuable, that's where you will draw your strength in your life from or your supposed life. And that is called an idol. That's called an idol. Where do I get my strength? Where do I get my life from? Is it from grace or something else? From God, or is it from my marriage? Because I love my wife. She's awesome. <laughs> or is it from my kids? I, oh, I pour my life out of my kids. I just go to every soccer game five days a week. I'm there. My life is about my kids. What's supremely valuable to you is it your finances. Because you got a nice bank account, and that's a cushion. That's your safety net. That's what you look for. That's your source of happiness. Is it possibly your social status? Because people like you. I mean, that's kind of nice. Whatever in your heart you find supremely, supremely valuable, that is what ultimately will shape you and give you identity. Do you remember uh, last week when Paul used this picture of the potter? And so if you're, if you're a potter, you, you take the lump of clay and you throw it on the potter's wheel. It just boom, sits there, right? It's all wonky, weird looking. And the goal, you have, to, you have to get it in the right position in, in order to shape it. It has to be centered. It has to be centered. If it's not centered, it's going to fight you. And so God, he's made the point, right? God is centering you. And you, sometimes we're fighting God. Well, if God's not the center of your life, if he's not the one who's forming you and shaping you, if he's not the one who you're getting your identity from, then one of those other things has its hands around you. That is the thing that's shaping you. That's your idol. And if you're not willing to trust God, if you're like, I don't know if I like, really, it's because of unbelief. I, I don't believe God is who he says he is. Well, okay, that's a faith issue. God wants to give you faith. But also, if I don't believe God is who he says he is, then, and I try to worship him, then really I'm worshiping some other version of God, which is not God. The essence of idolatry is entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of Him. Entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of Him. And when I live in idolatry, I draw my identity from my idol. What's shaping you? What's shaping you on the potter's wheel? We are who we are as believers because of grace. Let grace shape you. Let Jesus shape you. Let Him raise you up, seat you, and give you a place with Him. You're already there if you're a believer. Now live into it. 
This is who we were in the past. This is who we are now. And now, the, the, the kind of the last half of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 22, talks about who we are together. This is who we are together. Not just who we are individually, but who we are together. Let's go ahead and read it. Remember, therefore, that formerly you who are Gentiles, that's everybody in this room likely, I mean not Jewish, okay, uh, by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at that time, before, okay, you were, past tense, verb, that's a to be, you were in the past separate from Christ, okay? Excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. The result was you were without hope and without God in the world. This is who we were and then who we are as we become citizens. We become, we're no longer separate, excluded, and without God. We have become citizens. Now, citizenship was a big deal for Paul. This is a metaphor that he liked to use often, and he used it because he, he understood it. He was a citizen of Rome. Now, according to Jerome, an early church father, uh, he, he lived around 300, 400 A.D., he, he wrote that Paul, his parents, came from the town of Geshala of Tarsus. Now, they were prisoners of war taken away, and a Roman bought them. The Roman enslaved them, and eventually set them free, and granted them citizenship. And Paul was born a citizen, as opposed to the commander in Acts chapter 22 who had to work really hard for his citizenship. Well, when you become a citizen, you get certain privileges. Like in America, the privileges you get, you get Medicare. It's kind of nice, right? You get habeas, the law of habeas corpus, so I get a fair trial. And not just a fair trial. Here in America, I get the right to an appeal if I don't like the judge or I think it was off, you know? Also, one of the things I get here in America is that if, I, I know this because I've been overseas in a lot of countries, if I get in a tough situation, the government will come after me. We've got a government who will come after us and fight for us. Not every government's like that. When we become citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we get granted certain rights that no one can take away. Now, Remember at that time, you were excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise. And this right here is a picture of a, it's a, it's a note or a proof of citizenship. It's a military diploma that a soldier in one, uh, AD 100 worked to get. It's made of bronze. And that's what he would show to show you as part of it. Well, in Christ, we who now are citizens, we are members of God's household. We're now part of the family. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. When we become a member of the kingdom of God, God gives us certain privileges. He, right, remember, what are all the things he did for us, right? He made us alive. He raised us up. He seated us with him. Seated us with him. He reconciled us to God. You who once were far away have been brought near, it says later on in Ephesians. God has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Here's a, a picture of the sign that Paul showed last week. The sign basically says it was at the entrance to the temple, and all who are Gentiles, who are not part of the family, who are not citizens of the kingdom of heaven, it said, if you enter here, it's not our fault if people kill you. <laughs> it's not our fault if you die. We're not responsible for your death. God has removed this barrier for us to go close to Him now. There's now nothing separating us. And th through Him, through Jesus Christ, we now have access to the Father. There's a famous picture a while back of President Kennedy in his room in the Oval Office in the Resolute Desk, and below him is his son. Just plan. The son always has access. We always have access to a father. It's not just to talk to him in prayer every once in a while. What we have access to boldly approach the throne of God, a God who is holy, just, righteous, and sometimes angry, angry at sin. But we walk into him knowing that we are fully blameless and secure and set apart. All right, he's called us, and he's made us holy, and we are being made holy. Now, some of us here, I don't know about anybody in this room, we have yet to cross the line into citizenship. Pastor Will, he was telling me the story of his grandma. 
Uh, she grew up in Wisconsin. She went to college in Texas, and then she moved to Portland. And she was going to go on a trip, right? And so she get ready to go to the trip, and she realized she couldn't go. She wasn't a citizen. So she had came over, come over on the boat from Holland, and she never went through the process of becoming a citizen. Some of us have never crossed the line to becoming a citizen of the kingdom of God. So you can go to church. You can do lots of churchy things. You can serve. You can try to add all, add up all of your good deeds, but until you reach out your hand and say, through faith, I accept this gift of grace, you're not in. You're not a citizen. God wants you to give you that chance. He wants you to accept the free grace that comes from him, not because you're anything special, but because he loved you and he created you and he created you with a purpose. And he wants you to feel and know the love that comes from him. He doesn't want you to stay drowning like my, the guy my brother saved in the milky water, holding his breath, hoping that someone would come. If you're hoping your breath, holding your breath, hoping that someone will come, you got your hand reached out, you need a breath, call out to Jesus and he'll save you. He will reach down and pull you up and give you new life. That's the message of grace. We don't deserve it. We barely recognize it, and we hardly appreciate it. But God gives it to us. This lady, Nancy Holden, she, uh, she eventually got her citizenship. And even though she was super annoying, and the villagers voted her down, ultimately the government, the ones in authority who are above the villagers, granted her citizenship. And God has, no matter how annoying you are, <laughs> no matter what you've done, no matter what stuff you got hidden in your past, and I know there's some stuff, God wants you to become a part of his kingdom so that you can take a seat with him and sit with him in the heavenly realms. At our, at our last congreg congregational meeting in South Umqua, we asked people, what, what do people here want? And two things popped up to the, very, to the surface. One of those is people want to belong to something greater than themselves. That's a, that's, a, that's a heart desire. If you want to belong to something greater than yourself, there's lots of causes out there. Okay, you, can, man, you can devote your life to fighting cancer, to fighting human trafficking. I mean, that's, those are great causes. You can join Bill Gates and fight for clean water and spend all your money and your time and your life doing that. But all of these causes, in the end, they will end. They will, it will all end. And then you will be left without God. Unless you cross the line to salvation. Unless you say, I want to receive this free gift of grace. I want to receive this free gift of grace. So we're going to give you the, the opportunity uh, this morning to receive the free gift of grace. If you don't know who Jesus is, you want to give your life to him, today could be the day. But first, I'm going to pass off to the campus pastors, Pastor Will and uh, Pastor Paul down at my campus. I love you guys down there, South Umpqua. See you later. So for us, a couple questions. The first one is, or something to do. All right, oops, I forgot this one. You belong here. That's the, that's the main idea. That's what I really want you to get. You belong here. It's kind of a, a summary of all of Ephesians chapter 2. This week, if I see myself the way God sees me, how would I approach God differently? It's a question for you. So how does God see me? He sees me as made alive. He sees me as raised up, seated with him, reconciled, brought near. Okay? He sees me as those things. If I saw myself that way, how would I approach God differently? Would I be like the kid, Ken, John F. Kennedy's son, in his room, who can always go up to his father and talk to him. How would I approach God differently? And the second thing, share with someone how you have received grace. And this is, I'm talking about the grace of God, not like your wife forgave you because you left the toilet seat up. I mean, that's nice, but share with someone else how you have received grace. In order to do that, you have to remember where you came from, right? You got to remember some of the stuff. What did God save you from? 
Those are the two questions do apply. And now, for those of you who have, have yet to cross the line, who have not yet entered the kingdom of God, and who want to, who want to receive that free gift of grace, I'm going to pray. And we're going to pray a prayer of salvation. You can just agree along in your heart. And then afterwards, come and talk to, that. we have the prayer corner that will be open just after this, right over here. I'll be over here. I'll be glad to pray with you and talk with you. Um, or if you want to talk about anything else as well. But yeah, let's go ahead and pray. You have to close your eyes. I'll pray. Lord God, thank you that you love us, Lord, and that you care for us. Lord, you sent your son to die for us. Lord, we believe in our heart that you, Jesus Christ, came and lived and died and rose again. Father, we need you. We choose to accept this grace, Lord. We repent and say, God, forgive us of our sins. We want to have a right relationship with you. Help us to now turn the other way and walk towards you, away from the direction we're going and towards you. We confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. We now give our lives to you once again. If you've already done this, Lord, we give our lives to you once again. And if I have not yet, Lord, I now give my life to you. I believe, Lord, that you have a plan for me. I ask you to show me who you want me to be, show you where you want me to go. Lord, I choose to live out the life you prepared for me. Thank you, Father. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know, um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.